Welcome to Masters with Masters. This is a special knowledge sharing activity jointly sponsored between the German Aerospace Center, or DLR, and NASA. And we are very excited to have the leaders of both of these organizations. I'm Ed Hoffman, NASA's director for the Academy for Program Project and Engineering Leadership. And over the next uh, period of time, what we'll be doing is sharing some of the thoughts, reflections, and experiences uh, from a career in space and managing uh, complex type programs. Very excited to have uh, two special uh, guests here for this activity. I've been told uh, to be informal in the introductions. So we have uh, Jan Werner, who is the chairman of the executive board of German Aerospace Center, or DLR. He's been in that role since March of 2007. Before that, he was the president of Darmstadt Technological University uh, for about 12 years. And uh, he joined Darmstadt in 1990 as head of testing and research institute uh, after a career in civil engineering. So welcome to NASA. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. And we have also Charlie Bolden. Uh, the NASA Administrator, who has been in the position as NASA Administrator since July of 2009. Before coming to NASA, he served uh, for 34 years uh, in the U.S. Marines, serving uh, for 14 of those years uh, as part of the Astronaut Corps and retiring as a two-star general, and uh, obviously flew on four space shuttle missions, uh, including the uh, deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope and the first U.S.-Russian shuttle mission. Thank, thank you both thank you. Uh, for being here, uh, many people, and we're all excited. Uh, we have an audience here in the James Webb uh, Auditorium, and uh, there will be an opportunity for, for questions. But to get started, uh, I'd like to talk about the collaboration between NASA and DLR, which has gone on for, for several decades. Uh, in your blog, uh, one of the things you mentioned is when you think of NASA uh, and DLR, uh, it's two organizations mutual ideas. Uh, maybe you can, can share what, what you mean by that. If you look to the both organizations, NASA on the one hand side and DLR on the other hand side, you, you see some uh, similarities and some differences. So for instance, the similarity is that both of us share the interest in space and aeronautics, which is not common in the world. Look to the world, you will find uh, only a few organizations like that who are at the same time or which are at the same time working in space and aeronautics. Um, this is a similarity. And another similarity is that both of our institutions are space agencies and we are also doing research. Um, you are doing the research in your labs at Ames, at uh, JPL, at Dryden, uh, Goddard, etc. And DLR is, is a research center at the same time. So we are a research center and space agency. So we have something in common but also some differences. So for instance, we are also um, uh, having the aspects of energy and transportation. I mean, uh, trains, cars, etc. in our program, which makes a difference. But there is another big difference, and this is money. So uh, <laughs> there is uh, a gap. We should call it a gap, a minor gap. No, it's a big gap between <laughs> the financial situation of NASA and DLR. And therefore, I'm really, uh, I feel very much honored to be here at the same time with Charlie to discuss about uh, mutual activities we had in the past and we may have in the future. Right. And uh, NASA and DLR have collaborated many times over the dec decades in, in all the different uh, uh, mission areas. Uh, what do you see as the ingredients that lead to a successful and you know, what's obviously a mature relationship? I think as Jan has mentioned, uh, one of the things that, that has been critical is, is our basic principles of the things that, in which we believe. And we were comparing, for example, the President Obama's national space policy that we rolled out in July with the recent, re recently released policy in Germany. And they, um, they very much mirror each other, the importance of international cooperation, the importance of commercial involvement and, uh, and, and utilization, and then the importance of research and development. And those are the three key items uh, in the president's space policy, but also uh, things that in which there is no disagreement, whether you're talking about Congress or the White House, um, the importance of aeronautics, the importance of science, increased uh, funding for science in our case and for aeronautics, and then the critical importance of education, and those are areas in which we continue to work. Right. You've also mentioned in the past that uh, trust and relationships 
don't come usually from institutions only or agreements. They come from the personal relationship. And did that come from your experience uh, in the astronaut corps, or how, how did some of those uh, experiences that you've had led to? If I look at if I look at recent set? experiences, and recent for me would be the last forty years. Uh, since <laughs> since leaving since leaving Columbia, South Carolina, and, and migrating away, uh, my experience in the military and NASA and everywhere has been uh, most places in the world except the United States. Uh, any successful business venture requires an aspect of trust, which is built on on a period of time of interaction and interchange, where there is a personal relationship established among the parties. Uh, the U.S. is probably the only place I've ever been where you may not even know anybody and you sign a deal. Um, it, most other places in the world, uh, you meet and you sip tea or you drink coffee or something, and after weeks or months of getting to know each other and becoming comfortable and trusting, then, then you sign an agreement. But of course, at the same time, you need to have something to give each other. I mean, it's, uh, the, the personal friendship or the personal relation is very important, and I totally agree with that. Uh, for me personally, it's also very important, and therefore I'm very happy to be here. But at the same time, it's also, of course, a question, can we, uh, can the other partner give something in a partnership? And uh, I have the feeling that in the partnership between NASA and DLR, there is a, a lot which we can give each other. For instance, if you look to Sophia, the uh, uh, flying telescope, mm -hmm. infrared telescope, so we have really a, a perfect match. So it was the competence of NASA for the plane and everything, and then there was a competence of DLR giving the instrument, the, the telescope, and all this. So it was a perfect match. And I was very happy that you are not looking for just is it 50-50 by money, but is it something we can do together and then we are better than each of us. And if I were to add a final piece, it would be uh, as I travel around, um, no matter where I go, uh, there are three principles on which we always operate. And and that's the issue of transparency, uh, being honest with each other. Uh, reciprocity, meaning, as Jan said, there are things that we can give back and forth. They may not be, uh, they may not have any involvement in money or funds, but there are reciprocal things that we can do. And the third is there must be a mutual benefit to both. Otherwise, you know, there's no, no really right. need to right. do it or interest in doing it. Yeah. And, and Jan, one of the things, you, you come from a background which is diverse in civil engineering. Uh, you spent time in Japan uh, studying earthquake safety. How, how does coming you know, from a different background into aerospace where you're working with different international partners, sectors, different disciplines, how does that shape your thinking uh, and, and help you in it, your leadership? It shaped more than just thinking. First of all, earthquake engineering is a good basis for space technology because it's very dynamic. And therefore, <laughs> it's also a good basis for what we are doing here. You see, it is, from my childhood, I was always interested in space technology. Um, my father put me on his arm and said, oh, look, over there, there is Sputnik. I did not see anything, but I believed him. <laughs> uh, and then I followed all the American missions. Uh, really, I have them at home. Yeah, I can show you. I can, you can uh, check that. I followed everything. I, I knew everything. Buzz Aldrin and all these uh, people who uh, Buzz Aldrin was here. But I really followed everything, and then I was just a civil engineer. But an engineer has also some thinking, and I tried uh, to develop. And then I became, uh, by chance, uh, president of a university. And this was, for my opinion, it was a good basis, um, even for future work, which I'm doing right now, because as a president of a university, you have also to uh, tackle some problems, financial problems, you have a diversity of professors, which is a very special race. Uh, and then you have, um, you have international contacts. And, based, and I was lucky enough that I could uh, um, convince the government at that time to give uh, the university I was president of a special law. Uh, full autonomy for a public university was, uh, was a uh, great deal. And then I said, OK, now after 12 years, um, I should try to have even a higher challenge. And I was very lucky, and this is more than just some feeling. It shaped my life. The last three years have changed everything for me, um, and uh, I'm very grateful about that, that I have this chance in my life. It's unbelievable. Right. And, and so the, uh, these experiences have, have played uh, where you are. It sounds like these last three years have been a good period of, of three years. Just perfect. Just perfect, I can tell you. Especially the, the relations also to NASA, the, the trust I felt over here, the, the, 
the personal feelings we could share, that the doors were open for me, that, that, that I could see what is really happening over here, that we developed further corporations. Um, I'm grateful for that. And uh, the last three and a half years, uh, I can just say, perfect. Of course, there is some work, but this is what we like to have. Exactly. Yeah. I'd like to, at some point, maybe come back to the, the trust that, that you talk about. But one of the key themes that we're all hearing about that's important is uh, technology, uh, new technology, new approaches. Uh, one of the areas that, that you've written about, you, you talked about the fact that evolutionary technological development uh, requires continuity, while as revolutionary development and breakthroughs requires autonomy. Uh, can you talk to that? And, and what's the importance of autonomy if you're going to have a uh, revolutionary or, or maybe radical breakthrough? Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I, uh, I thought about that because I had to give a, a lecture, and the question was, is technology evolutionary or revolutionary? That was the question. And during the preparation of that talk, I wasn't clear. So I looked at first and thought, okay, nature is for sure is evolutionary, from the Big Bang to the universe, uh, from single cell organism to Homo sapiens, everything is more or less evolutionary. Of course, if you look in detail, it's not evolutionary. There are always some leaps, some steps ahead uh, from single cell organism to higher uh, organism, etc. So there are also some steps, but it's more or less from an outer view, it's a continuous process. It's, it has some minor steps, but it's continuous. But if you look uh, really to revolution by leaps and bounds, then um, this is uh, as I like to have uh, our actual thinking. So uh, we should give our people, our staff, the possibility to really think revolutionary. That means that they try to make big leaps, even leaps, or even ideas where we say, uh, say at the beginning of this is ridiculous, but this is, uh, the dreams should be there, should be uh, possible, and therefore evolution is a continuous process. Evolution therefore needs also con continuity with regard to the financing and everything, but the revolution and this is what I like to have, is needs free space for the individual, free space for the institution, mm -hmm. and not detailing every day by saying, you have to do this screw in that hole and uh, screw it uh, three times to the right and one time to the left. This is not what I'm looking forward. So we are trying in DLR, inside, to give our scientists free space within our programs, which is a fairly complicated balance because we have some targets. Mm -hmm. But it's better to mention the target than to give the way to the target. So to, to tell the people we have a common target, so please try to come there with some uh, revolutionary ideas. And this needs autonomy on the individual uh, level as well as on the institutional one. Right. So you try to build in for people who work at DLR time where they can I wouldn't call it play, but I guess time where they can have the autonomy to, to yes. take on things that yes. would yes. be otherwise difficult. And I think it's also important for the institution as a whole. So uh, the, the new uh, strategy, space strategy of uh, Germany is just defining some uh, guidelines, some boundary conditions, some goals. And now it's up to DLR with all its uh, scientific knowledge, with, with its uh, creativity and so on, uh, to formulate within that a German space program. So this is one step of autonomy of free space. Now the next step is then below that, again, giving the scientists uh, targets or goals and challenges, and then they should see within a, a certain budget how to get there. Right. And for NASA, it's the same, uh, obviously, demands the president has called for NASA to step up in terms of technological innovation mm -hmm. uh, to address some of the societal challenges of understanding the climate better, monitoring Earth, uh, human presence, and, and the whole issue of revolutionary breakthroughs. Um, how do you see NASA trying to facilitate uh, addressing that, making us more I, I innovative? One of, one of our challenges in, in being a reliable international partner um, is that we go through periodic, like every two-year and four-year cycles, um, one of the things that I am excited about the budget that President Obama rolled out for us, the national space policy, is I think by calling on, by emphasizing the importance of international cooperation, in a way you sort of, you sort of demand that there be some repetitiveness or some, uh, some continuity. 
to the way you do things. That is not historically the way the United States has done its space program. Um, if you look at how we got to where we are today, I would say, you know, Jan mentioned the, this revolutionary development. Uh, Apollo Soyuz was revolutionary. It, it was a time of war, the Cold War, but people felt that it was really important to do something different. And so we did Apollo Soyuz. The International Space Station, on the other hand, while it had a, it had a geopolitical reason to start, that was an evolutionary development that has brought in 15 or more international partners over time. And it is something that when it came time for us to evaluate what we were going to do in the future, the international partners came in and told the Augustine Committee, for example, you cannot get rid of the International Space Station. You know, our plan was to do away with it. Uh, but the international community said, we have time and money and everything invested in this, and we are finally about to, to see the point where we can now do legitimate science. You can't step away from that. So I think that, you know, that's why the president and, and I both like increased international involvement, because it, it demands that there be some consistency in the programs that you put in place. And uh, one of the things we'll, we'll get perhaps some questions here, here shortly, but you're making an interesting link between innovation and technology uh, going into in new ways, but also the collaboration, the partnering. And um, obviously with the International Space Station, it's been in a process of being built. Now we have a decade uh, or more to, you know, to work and, and get science out of that. How is that uh, serving as a model for how we partner together internationally and, and the benefits of that and, and moving I forward. I think there are a number of things with Station. It serves as a model for international collaboration and partnership uh, because it is, it is the result of treaties uh, among nations. But then, as we started talking about initially, there is the matter of building trust, and that has come with time. That has been a very painful uh, partnership in its development. When you talk about ESA, Roscosmos, um, the That's Japanese, it. us, the Canadians, you know, on and on and on. Very diverse interests and very diverse capabilities. But Station has allowed uh, nations of incredibly diverse capability to come together into one enterprise where, where, again, if I go back to this reciprocity, every partner is able to contribute something. It may not be the same monetary value, but in terms of contribution to the effort, um, everybody's on an, on an equal footing. Yeah. And if I may add something concerning the International Space Station. The International Space Station is, for us now, it's a perfect international forum for interaction. But it's also a perfect forum for uh, actual science. And now you are using the word innovation. So we have now, within DLR, we uh, looked into a little bit more into detail what is in innovation. And we make a difference, maybe it's in English language not correct, but we are doing that, between an intervention um, and an innovation. So the scientific, scientific process starts with an idea mm -hmm. and invents something and comes to, a, to, a, to knowledge, to maybe a product, even maybe a procedure or whatever. And then innovation is, to our understanding, something like a product for the market. Now, how to, to combine these both? I will show you an example from the International Space Station. From the German side, there was an experiment on the International Space Station financed through DLR concerning complex plasmas, plasmas to being, uh, being an ionized gas. And uh, this can be very specially investigated under zero gravity conditions. So now this was the first the step of the scientist, just to understand what is a complex plasma, how does it behave, uh, how can we influence it. And then the same idea was put into a market product. And this is now in Germany uh, because you can use this plasma, the cold plasma, um, for health uh, medication if you have wounds um, and to kill all the bacteria, etc. So it's a link from basic scientific research on the, on the space station to a finally market, uh, market uh, possible product. So this is the link uh, which is from a first idea to a final innovation. And this is by ISS. It's a perfect tool for that. And we all should do our very best in the next 10 years to use ISS as a scientific research lab. Yeah, and I, I guess also Germany, obviously, was one of the first nations uh, to, have a, uh, to have a person uh, in space. Uh, and how much does that also stimulate uh, not just uh, the ideas, the innovations, but also uh, people 
uh, to, to take space more seriously and the potential benefits of that? Is, is that something that, you know, that has a tangible benefit? We have, um, we had, of course, uh, two Germans uh, were the first uh, from foreign countries being in space uh, beyond, uh, besides uh, America and Russia, uh, and both were uh, from, one from East Germany and one from West Germany. Interesting enough, one flew with the Russians, one flew with the Americans. Uh, we have now in our board, executive board also, an astronaut, Thomas Reiter. Uh, of course, astronauts uh, are, for my, for, for my opinion, they are the best ambassadors for space activities of all types, not only for human space flight, but also for other space activities, because they are authentic. If I'm talking about, about space, I try to convince people, but it's just a civil engineer who is talking. Yeah. But if you, if you use a real uh, astronaut, it's much better. So I have my colleague, Thomas Reiter. Space is... And you mentioned that you are using the word benefit. And again, I would uh, like to refer to the German uh, space strategy. This paper says very strictly, space should have benefit. And when I read it first, I thought, oh, my gosh, is it just commercially? Or what is, what is the idea behind that? But then the explanation is very clear. Science is benefit of space. Understanding of the universe is benefit of space. Understanding the Earth is benefit of space developing new technologies which can be used for different understanding is benefit. So benefit is a very broad understanding in that strategy and therefore yes, in Germany we feel that uh, space has a big fascination for young people. We can use space activities um, not only for space but also for other technological aspects for uh, science and uh, engineering. So it's a perfect, uh, perfect instrument for us. Yeah, so a stimulus for science, yes. technology, math, and, right. uh, and management, uh, I'm sure, in terms of you have to come up with new ways of leading yes. in terms of some of these, these challenges. Uh, we have uh, a few questions that I've received, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through some of this. Uh, first question is, establishing uh, international agreements between agencies is not easy. It took the International Space Station several years to hammer out uh, with involvement of the U.S. State Department and, and foreign governments. How can future partnerships with NASA be made, uh, you know, easier? So, so what, what did we learn in terms of maybe some of the challenges, and how can we uh, partner better now and in the future? I can just tell that the agreement between NASA and DLA took not uh, uh, decades. It took half a year. Mm -hmm. in, in some of this year, we said, okay, let's have a framework agreement, and just today we signed it. So that's the easy way. Use DLA and NASA. Everything is off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things is, is continuous involvement among the parties. Um, yeah. You know, when you collaborate time and time again, then it's much easier to get together and say, okay, we want to cement this agreement. And, and Jan talked about the framework agreement that he and I signed this morning. Um, that's a result of, of collaboration and partnership through the years. But then we signed another agreement that, that brought uh, Germany into the, the uh, Lunar Science Institute. Uh, that took much less time, but again, that was because they had been collaborating and found that there was value in it for Germany and value in it for the other international partners in, in the, the Lunar Science Institute. Right. And obviously, I mean, you've been a part of it on the, the, the side of being an astronaut mm -hmm. and collaborating from the beginning in terms of international. and. And now as a, an executive and a leader in terms of uh, many of the, the challenges go beyond just a space organization. It goes with uh, society in terms of getting ready to, to move ahead. Do you, do you feel from the experiences of the International Space Station and others that we are better and, and uh, a, able to work better and, and, and back, move out? You know, I, I would go back even farther than the International Space Station. Back when I, was, when I first came into the NASA, um, and we started flying uh, space laboratory missions, space lab missions. Uh, the very first international mission that we flew uh, was D-1. You know, that was the very first international space laboratory mission. The United States flew that mission for Germany. It was a German mission flown on the space shuttle, uh, you know, in a laboratory inside the module. Uh, we did the same thing later, subsequently did it with, with the Japanese and we learned through those types of collaborations that you can do that. So those were sort of precursors to the International Space Station, if you will. And we are ready to be precursors for future missions. 
That's good. Well, actually, this is, I guess, a follow-up question, uh, you know, for some of this is, is how do you see German-American uh, collaboration and partnership grow from this point forward? Um, I guess that's some of the discussions that you've had without going, but... No, I would say, you know, we, we have a number of, uh, of agreements for projects in the future, uh, whether, whether it's missions like Destiny or others, where we have been working and, and there are missions that are laid out years from now. Uh, but there are evolving missions if we look at the, at the aeronautics, for example. Um, those are much more tightly coupled and much more shorter, I think, shorter turnaround than, say, space mission. Space missions you plan years in advance. Aeronautics, there may be something that comes up, like we're both working right now on, they don't call it next gen, but we do. It's, it's developments in, in ways to, to move aircraft more efficiently and effectively through airspace throughout the world. Uh, ways to reduce pollution. We work cooperatively on that. Those things started, you know, a year ago or a year and a half ago. So it, it's not just space, but the, the partnership that involves space and aeronautics, which is somewhat unique to NASA and DLR, um, I think are important examples also. Yes. And uh, I, I think you, you've been addressing this all along. Uh, part of the question is, does that also extend to what's being called here game-changing technology developments? And from the discussion, it sounds like clearly that's a, a large part of what we're talking about, both the human exploration and the uh, scientific missions and technologies. I can, I can just say at least that um, from the discussions I had the last couple of days when I visited some of the uh, research uh, entities of NASA, that there are much more ideas of cooperation than we have money. And this is a good, right. good situation. Always. Just imagine it would be the other way around. Yeah. It would be terrible. So uh, there are several ideas of the scientists in all the different fields. You're mentioning the aeronautics. Yes, it's, uh, there is already a good cooperation um, concerning air traffic management and other aspects. And I'm sure that we will uh, intensify that one. We are in the space area, and maybe we even find uh, totally different areas where we can uh, work together. But we are also working together in the outreach area. Uh, so because both of us have their programs for young people uh, to convince them or to, to show the fascination of uh, space and other activities, and therefore we are always very grateful uh, if the cooperation between NASA and DLR is not only a cooperation between the administrator and me, but it's also between the scientists, between the public relations people. So it's really a spread uh, to, the, to the total institutions. And this is, I think, a very good deal we are doing. And so we've been talking a lot about uh, certainly human collaboration, but a large part of the collaboration between NASA and DLR has been uh, in the areas of science, uh, science missions in, in things like, obviously, missions like SOFIA and GRACE uh, and the Helios probes. Um, what role does the collaboration potentially play outside of just space agencies, but for folks and young professionals who are interested in some of the societal challenges? Uh, how, does, uh, how does space help in terms of some of the issues that, that we're dealing with in terms of climate change, uh, space weather, yeah. orbital debris, um, which goes, again, beyond just the, the aerospace community? Most of our international partners are not capable of doing the level of, of widespread activity that DLR and, and Germany happen to be able to do. Most of our international partners um, are much smaller, um, and, and they do what they consider to be, they, they, they refer to it as uh, satisfying societal needs. Most of those tend to be earth science experiments that happen, to, they, they study climate change. Uh, we have a program called SEVERE, for example, that we work with three regions of the world where we do things like help undeveloped nations, underdeveloped and developing nations, uh, collaborate to produce things like flood models or drought models and the like. Um, you know, those are, are things that Germany and the United States can collaborate on and make them available to other nations that want to be members of the Society of Spacefaring Nations but don't have the financial wherewithal to, to go in whole hog. Space activities is not only a, an aspect of the NASA and DLR. It's mm -hmm. really spread uh, around the globe and for all types of life, for all types of what you can do. So, of, of course, navigation, communication without space would not be possible. By the way, navigation is also a good example to show that basic science is not just a thing of scientists. 
because the Einstein uh, theory of relativity has to be considered in order to have good signals for navigation. Otherwise, you would have a big mistake. But also, um, we are DLR's member of the Charter for Space and Major Disasters, where we help to uh, use space information for uh, ca uh, catastrophes or man or uh, human or uh, uh, natural disasters. So this is also a help where we help other uh, nations who don't have the ability directly. F let's just consider Haiti, the earthquake. Mm -hmm. After the earthquake, uh, the uh, big institutions gave all the information to, uh, to the organizations to help um, on site where, is, where to go first how to go there, which uh, road, which street uh, is accessible. So this type of uh, help to, uh, to uh, other countries, I think this is one of our responsibilities. And space is really day-by-day day help. Um, and it's interesting that in German language, space uh, can be decided as all. And uh, day means tag. So all tag would mean space day. But this has at the same time, the same uh, uh, minute has the information as every day. So this is an interesting wording. So space day is every day. That's <laughs> one of the things you're also talking about is that uh, in these communities, there is obviously a significant global expertise uh, in science, in the engineering disciplines, and uh, in different fields. Um, with all the knowledge and with all the things that are always going on, how, how do we share knowledge and, and how do we do that effectively so we're able to, to use that to, to society's challenges and, and to our own you know, goals? Sometimes we're forced together, as we were after the war, after World War II. Uh, you know, we had Robert Goddard, we had, uh, we had other American rocketeers, but it was the, it was the addition of German expertise uh, in the world of rocketry that, that is the basis of what we do today. When you look at the Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, and what Dr. Von Braun and his team brought to, to that area of the country, but to NASA. Um, you know, so sometimes you're forced together for, for different reasons. Other times you have the luxury of going out and, and searching things that you can do together, as we are fortunate enough to be able to do today. We pick and choose. Right. We talked a little bit before coming down here about um, you know, our ongoing efforts in exploration and, and now how we have what we call, the, you know, and m most people don't understand it, but when you talk about a flexible path mm -hmm. process for exploration, it means that with international partners, uh, everybody doesn't want to do the same things. The Germans don't have a lot of interest in Mars right now. We do. Uh, the Germans have a lot of interest in the moon. We do, but not quite to the level that they do. So the collaboration means maybe they head up a mission that's a lunar mission. We are in support. We head up a mission that's a Mars mission. They're in support. And I think you're going to find that that will be the way that we do it more and more as we go along. President Obama has really emphasized not just expanding international cooperation, but what we call putting internationals in the critical path, which means you cannot get to that point without the participation and the, and the success of your international partner. Which gives some burden to the partner, oh, yeah. but also some chance. And I mean... Moon and Mars, and they're also moon of the Mars. So maybe that's a common idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if you look at, if right. you look at, again, go back to the International Space Station and where we are now. Uh, we have agreed that we will expand the, the utilization of the International Space Station to at least 2020 and possibly beyond. We will not be successful in doing that if the international partners are not able to deliver an ATV, uh, you know, from the European Space Agency and, and Germany, uh, HTV from Japan. If, if we don't have those vehicles available, we're in trouble because that's the way you get supplies and, and, and equipment and experiments and the like to the International Space Station. If our other partners, if the commercial entities can't deliver, uh, and this is the reason it's so critical that today's mission of Falcon 9 uh, be successful, because they are a critical part of the team now. There, there's no more NASA uh, doing everything by itself. Not that we ever did, I don't think. We probably said we did. But, but today, we are forced to admit that we are part of a, of a collaboration of academia, industry, and international partners. And we cannot be successful unless we all work together. It, it makes me think that in the old 
uh, days we talked about rocket, the challenge of rocket science. It sounds like the rocket science is as much uh, how we work together in collaboration. And uh, how do you recommend to managers of projects or to engineers who are now coming in and working in this kind of environment where you're working with industry and academia and international partners and making all these, how do you make that work okay, it's, in that uh, kind of There is no magic formula, of course. <laughs> uh, but what I would recommend is uh, young people, and I'm, I see that they are doing it more and more, first of all, to really learn about the other system. So to really to be in an industry for a certain time, to be in academia for a certain time helps, of course, to understand both worlds. To be in a, in a foreign country, uh, also we, we are, the global, the global society is uh, getting more and more together. Of course, there are different cultural heritages, different mm -hmm. cultural understandings, but this is a very special challenge. So I, unfortunately, during my whole uh, time at school, I did not went abroad. I did not go abroad, not at all. I even had no interest, I have to say. This was a mistake, I don't know by whom, uh, but anyhow. And then <laughs> suddenly, when I was in this uh, civil engineering office, I always thought, okay, my wife was asking, do we go abroad? I said, no, I'm a civil engineer. Stay at home and make my bridges and everything. <laughs> and then one day, my boss came and said, okay, Mr. Werner, uh, there is an idea. We should, have, we should send somebody for one year to... Uh, to uh, Japan, I had no Japanese language uh, competence, nothing. I said, okay, I will go. And he said, no, no, go at home, ask your wife. I said, no, no, I will go. He thought I'm a strong person. But in fact, I was very weak because my wife was always asking for that. <laughs> so I went abroad. I went abroad. Um, by the way, my wife could not come the first uh, time with me because she had to follow uh, her study at university. But this changed my life. So it's still that to go abroad... Hmm and to see what is happening, how they are working, this opens your mind, hopefully. Um, and therefore, I think this would be a recommendation what I, was, or would I, what I would always give managers or people who would like to be managers. Try to see the other worlds, the other worlds, not only one. Mm -hmm. And then to learn about it, and uh, I think NASA and DLR is doing very nicely in that because we are exchanging people. This is, this is one common way we could do. Maybe we have uh, the next time we have an administrator and CEO chair uh, interaction and uh, exchange that I'm for <laughs> some time <laughs> the administrator and you can have DLR for some time. <laughs> you see, what I mean is clear that, that we exchange to understand what is ha happening. And right. whenever I'm at NASA, I'm learning more about how the system is functioning. And this helps because it gives trust, it gives understanding, it gives a good basis for future cooperation. Interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. The previous uh, Masters with Masters, uh, you know, Jean-Jacques Gourdin, you know, said the most important uh, skill is having a global mindset. And that's, that's what both of you are, are talking about in many ways. Uh, we have a couple of other questions uh, from the audience here. And one of them is, there are many issues facing the world in general, uh, such as global warming, disaster monitoring, to name a few. What are your views on how to use space systems to achieve solutions to these global issues? A question back. How not to use space for these? Of course, global activities can be especially observed with global perspective, and space can do that. So um, global warming, of, just, just let uh, look into the actual news concerning the rise of the water uh, after melting of some ice. There was uh, the idea of scientists that if ice is melting uh, from, uh, from solid ground, that the water of the sea will, will rise. That was a very simple approach. Now, the, um, the first investigation shows that it's not like that. At some locations, it's rising. At some, some uh, regions, it's even lowering. So this is a new scientific question, which can only be answered by space technology, because only through space technology we get uh, the, the data, which then can be analyzed to get new scientific ideas. So space is not always the instrument solving the problems, but analyzing the problem. And if you understood the problem, you are on the first step to get also a solution for it. If I can give a con couple of concrete examples, you know, Jan mentioned earlier uh, the earthquakes in Haiti. Uh, within hours of the earthquakes occurring, 
overhead imagery from multiple nations was available for decision makers, for disaster management officials to take action. Um, one of the things that we in NASA are very proud of is that some of the satellites from, and I hope I get this right, so if Mike Freilich's listening, he can correct me, but some of our satellites in what we call the A-Train identified three specific landfalls or, or mudslide, landslides that were west of Port-au-Prince probably would not have been discovered for days, if not weeks, and that, that resulted in the saving of lives. The issue with the miners in Chile, um, while not exactly using space imagery, uh, what we did there was we used technology from space, not just physical, um, uh, mechanical technology, but, but physiology and medical science, things that we had to learn to operate for long periods of time on the International Space Station were applied to a real-world uh, disaster, and we ended up with 33 people being saved. That probably, it's hard to say whether it would have happened, right. but it, it, there's a good chance it would not have happened had it not been for the use of knowledge from space exploration, bringing it together with knowledge from people doing, serving societal needs. The, the, the drilling company that brought two kids in, for, two kids, two people in from, uh, from, from uh, Afghanistan who had been drilling fresh water wells, uh, brought that technology to Chile and were able to increase uh, the rapidity with which we were able to get to the miners. So, um, you know, space applications are there every single day. And, and they One will continue. One more example, which I'm always uh, quoting because it's so important. There is a special, uh, I don't know how you call it in English, sudden child death. Uh, that's, uh, I don't yeah. know how you call Infant it. Death. Infant death. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, yes. will, I will still yes. use sudden yeah, child death. Sudden, yes. right. sudden child death is easier for me. Okay, but anyhow, uh, uh, and how to deal with that. And using mm. the sensors of the astronauts, uh, because they needed in, in space, uh, there was a special suit, a child suit developed, and this is now uh, securing the life of... Uh, hundreds of uh, children. So it's, it's direct, again, a direct trans transfer from space technology to that. Of course, you could say, OK, we could uh, develop it also without space. But this is always a question. Uh, from idea to the usage, it's not just a pass in that direction. It's some re a revolutionary idea which comes in between. And therefore, space is really excellent. The, 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 the drilling machine for, with uh, batteries uh, developed for Apollo 11 because they had no cable to the moon. Uh, so <laughs> you could say, OK, we don't, need, we don't need this development because we could develop on Earth. <laughs> but, but it is done by that. Because they use a hand crane. Really? <laughs> really? But you have nah, No. <laughs> Yes, so, so where good ideas come from is the research, the technology, the, you know, affecting uh, uh, obviously the applications. Necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. You know, we humans find that there is a need for something, and generally, it, it's the technolo technology push versus technology pull. Um, you know, I frequently think that technology pull uh, is much more effective than the other way around, but they both are necessary. Right. Yeah. Now here's a uh, here's a question from someone who uh, wrote their name down. Uh, it's Mark Lee uh, of NASA. And uh, we wrote down is the question is the International Space Station is designed for science and technology, but it's still very sparsely furnished, like a high rise uh, apartment without matching furniture to do its intended job. Is there an international effort to beef up the research capability of the International Space Station? So. Is there any... Uh, I would not say uh, that uh, Columbus, the European uh, uh, space uh, module or research module, is not furnished. Uh, it could be Mark more. Mark Lee said that. No, uh, no. Uh, it's no. not as furnished as my living room, yeah. but it's furnished uh, <laughs> uh, maybe as a, as a research lab. And of course, we could do more. And therefore, it's a German intention, very strong intention. And this is really a very mm -hmm. clear word that the next 10 years should be focused on usage of the ISS for science and technology. It's, uh, of course, it's complicated enough to, uh, to maintain uh, uh, the, the, the structure for human beings, and I understand that there's a lot of problems with uh, the water and all these aspects, but we should concentrate also 
after this big investment uh, by uh, several nations, especially the United States, we should now uh, also focus on the usage of ISS for scientific uh, purposes. And therefore, Germany was um, the first nation within the European com uh, area of the European Space Agency to say, yes, it's us who want to support ISS for the next at least 10 years. Yeah, there so is. there's a lot of things that are happening that will will continue in the next uh, yes. over the next decade. Um, we're getting uh, towards the end of our time, and uh, both of you have talked about uh, both in, in in discussions here, but also in, in the work you've been doing, the importance of young professionals uh, making space and room for a new generation to, to 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 address some of the issues and challenges that we have. Um, I'd like to start maybe with the notion of mentors. And I'd like to ask a question of who were your mentors uh, as you went through uh, different points of your career? And I'll, I'll start yeah. with Charlie. Who, who are the people that mentored you? You've heard me say this before. My, my, my first mentors were my mom and dad. I mean, incredibly valuable to me as educators, professional educators their entire life. Um, I did not become an educator because I saw how, how hard they worked and how, how devoted they were to that. And how, to be quite honest, how little they got paid. But that's the story of educators. And as I continued to develop, um, uh, I am a Marine today because uh, of a person I met when I first went to the Naval Academy who just impressed me incredibly. I sit here today because of a mentor by the name of Dr. Ron McNair. Um, I would have never applied for the space program had I not, you know, had I not met Ron. Yeah. yeah. In my and case, mentors. it's complicated. Um, of course, my parents were my mentors, and, but they were the, my mentors without being there. My father died when I was 13 years old. My mother said, okay, I will, uh, I will try to survive until you have a job. And she did so uh, with, a, with a time of just 14 days. So this was really extreme. So then I was more or less alone. I have a brother, an uh, elder brother, which I have a very good relation with. So my, pa my father was my mentor without being there. It's strange enough, but he gave me some feelings what should be values in the world and what should be personal value and uh, uh, trust and all these aspects. Also, I, all of these I learned when I was older than I was when I really could hear him. And then I had a, a, my, the person who, who sent me to Japan. This was uh, the, the head of this office, and uh, he was really something like a father to me. We had also some struggle like sons and fathers can have, but he is uh, Mr. Koenig. He was really the person, the mentor, the living mentor for me. And what advice? So clearly the, the importance of these people are, are noteworthy. What advice do you have to young people? professionals in terms of finding mentors or how do, you, how do you, how does that happen? Is it serendipitous or do you seek it out or what would you suggest? I, I think, you know, today a lot of people actively pursue mentors. Um, I, I frequently tell them, look and listen. Um, everyone that you meet can be a mentor and is a mentor. I, you know, my, my most recent or my, my contemporary mentors are my son and daughter. Um, you know, <laughs> they're incredible. I watch what they do, and, um, and I watch how they do it. And I couldn't do it that way. So I, I try to emulate the things that they do. Um, so I, I would say rather than go and, and go ask somebody if they will be a mentor, uh, 